All right. We'll start with review, as we always do. I like the cumulative review. It cements, and it for forces me to synthesize. Evangelism is, strictly speaking, verbally communicating the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with the call to repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins <clears throat> and for the receiving of eternal life. And we also speak of evangelism as the kind of activity we engage in with the imminent goal of sharing the gospel. We spoke of relational and stranger evangelism. Stranger evangelism being with people we'll likely never see again. And relational evangelism being with those we have recurring contact with. Some conversational questions I've encouraged for your evangelism are, what, I, what is your faith background? What do you believe? Do you go to church anywhere? Have you ever heard the gospel summarized before by a born-again Christian? Have you ever, has a Christian ever shared the gospel with you before? And if they say yes, you can build on what they say they heard. Or if you say, well, uh, what would, what's your understanding of the gospel? You can prompt them to summarize it and then work with the summary they attempt. And if they say no, you can say, well, may I explain it? I encourage greetings to develop a personal terminology for greeting others that is especially warm and familial to other believers and kind and welcoming to strangers. To ask open-ended questions that can potentially be reciprocated, aimed back at you, and to use that to your advantage, both for getting to know another person, for its own sake, right? And for opening doors for gospel conversations. I heard a fun story this week. Uh, Noah was talking to some acquaintances this week. And he asked them what they thought about extraterrestrial life. And he got some very worldly answers. They all kind of gave their opinions, and then they all turned it back on him, and they said, well, what do you think about aliens? And then he used it as an opportunity to talk about creation and the Christian worldview and the gospel. I thought that was a really interesting way to get into the conversation. So the rubric for evangelistic communication I gave was listening and asking questions, sharing and declaring, correcting and encouraging. Patient listening shows wisdom. It reduces tension. It helps you ponder how to answer. And it gives you an opportunity to silently pray. In asking curious and probative questions, you can take pleasure in understanding the purpose of someone's heart. You can learn more about people who are created in the image of God. You can find out if they understand the gospel. And you can show warmth and hospitality. By restating what another person says, you can show that you're listening. You can test whether something's meaningful. You can cut through rhetorical flourish. You can show optimism over the God-given value of language. And you can graciously improve upon another's poor communication. Last week, we spoke about sharing. This mode of speech offers something up for consideration. One strength here is on the accent of courtesy. You might ask, would you mind if I shared some reasons for why I believe this? Or would you mind if I showed you a passage from the Bible on that topic? Or would you mind if I took a few minutes to explain that? I encourage you to become intimately familiar with one of the four Gospels. Just pick one and learn to share Jesus stories from that in your evangelism. You can lead in with, do you know what Jesus said about that? Or do you remember when Jesus, or straightforwardly, can I share a Jesus story with you? I forgot to share a verse with you last week. In John 20, John writes, of his own gospel, these are written so that you may believe that Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that by believing you may have life in his name. So if the Gospel of John was written in part for evangelism. You can also have fun in sharing these stories, dramatizing or involving the other person, even prompting the other person to fill in the blanks. Let's fill out, let's finish the category of sharing by addressing the sharing of our own personal salvation stories. The saints are God's trophies. Paul says we are God's workmanship. God means to use your story as a testimony of his grace. You realize that final judgment, you're literally going to be a show-off of God's transformative grace, a public theater for others, a showcase. God is essentially showing off what he can do through you. This is tremendously helpful in evangelism. It does not have to be dramatic by worldly standards. It could be simple. You can offer to share your own story of what God did to save you, how he has been faithful to you, overflowing with the theme of God has been so good to me. God is so good. I remember just saying that offhanded one day at work. God is so good. And weeks later, someone said, that really struck me. As you share your own story, make sure that God gets the glory. Include in the story how you came to encounter God's word and his promises and weave within it elements of the gospel. I will briefly share my story. My parents brought me up in various Protestant churches. My dad was Air Force, so we bounced around the U.S. and went to different churches. I was brought up through Sunday school, Awana, and a multitude of adults in local churches fed me the word. I heard the gospel, but I did not take it seriously until high school. It was then that I learned how sinful I was. I sank deep into lust. I was a slave to pornography. I was arrogant to my teachers. I did not honor my parents. And I committed idolatry by entering into an interfaith dating relationship wherein I considered joining the Mormon church and giving up monotheism and the Trinity and other basic Christian doctrine. I was not shaping my desires after my beliefs. I was shaping my beliefs after my desires. It was during this season of life that I learned that I was not a good person who occasionally did bad things. No, I was a bad person. I didn't merely do bad things. I was bad. God put it on my heart to read the New Testament. In doing so, I encountered the person of Jesus in the four Gospels. And I read a passage in Romans that took me by surprise. I'd always heard of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but I'd never heard Romans 4, verses 4 and 5. Paul says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. This was stark and astounding to me. Think about that. God justifies, that means counts righteous, the ungodly. I thought, the ungodly, that's me. I'm ungodly, and I'm pretty sure, I was pretty sure at that point, I didn't have anything to offer God. Here Paul was telling me that I had to stop doing something in order to receive forgiveness. I had to stop working to be qualified, and I had to start trusting God, a particular God, the God who justifies the ungodly. He counts innocent, the guilty. He counts righteous, the unrighteous. And he counts worthy, the the unworthy. So I prayed. I was quite desperate at this point. Efforts to improve myself, to get on a consistent path of not doing bad things, were unsuccessful. I prayed with Romans 4 in mind, God, would you please forgive me, not just for the bad things I've done, but me. Would you not wait for me to first get better? Would you forgive all of me, down to the deep parts of me, right now for free. It was here that the gospel went off like firecrackers in my heart. God gave me the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
that Christ would die and shed his blood and cover all of my sins. This was true and sweet. There is nothing better. The next verses in Romans 4 quote from Psalm 32. Paul says, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. And then he quotes, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. A tip as you share your own story. Weave in the Bible as you share your story. Even if just to retrospectively make sense of what God was doing to you. One danger in the modern era is that we grant undue authority to people's personal or private or individual experiences as though they're unquestionable. But in a sense, your story is questionable. It is not infallible. We need God to help us understand our own story correctly. We do not have any inherent authority here as we share our own story. We need to appeal to another authority, one outside of ourselves. And what's safer and more appropriate way to share our own story than to bring it back to the authority of God's word, which sheds light on our own history and which speaks with infinite authority. The logic of the gospel had an immediate effect on me. I remember being in the car with my friend and my brother, and we were speaking harshly uh, and derisively toward my mother. And I reasoned, it was very, the gospel is very fresh to me, I reasoned, if I was unworthy and I was irrational and I was a sinful mess and yet God loved me, then shouldn't I be forgiven? Should, shouldn't I be forgiving toward others in my life who seemed irrational and difficult and sinful? I'm, I'm a teenager there who has a a horribly harsh view of parents, very distorted view. So looking back, I, you know, I probably was entirely wrong about what I was even thinking about my mother. But Paul writes in Colossians 3.13, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. So the logic of the gospel quickly took effect in my life where I started thinking, you know, even if I'm right about what I think about her, I, I ought to be kind and forgiving because God has been so kind toward me. My life has never been the same. God has been a father to me. He has not left me as an orphan. He taught me his word. He gave me the Holy Spirit. He adopted me into a community of grace, a fellowship of saints, and a brotherhood of believers. He has given me a needed friend in every season of life. He has exposed more of my sin, and yet he has offered me yet more grace. And I know that when I die, he will receive my spirit, he will usher me into his presence, and someday he will resurrect my body as he promised. If you need scriptural encouragement to share your own story, consider Psalm 66, verse 16. Come in here, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened but truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Now let's shift to the mode of declaring. Listening is great. Asking questions is wonderful. And the gentle mode of sharing something for someone else's consideration is, is good. But the gospel at the end of the day is not for mere consideration. Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all creation, to the whole creation. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by open statement of the truth. Consider that phrase, open statement of the truth. We would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So no trickery. Uh, in the end, it's not indirect. It's very straightforward. In, in fact, it's straightforward to the other's conscience. Wow. He goes on. For what we proclaim 
is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. The gospel, by its very nature, is a proclamation of the person and work of Jesus Christ. It heralds the good news of the death and resurrection and the authority of the Messiah, of the anointed king. So we cannot remain long-term in our discourse in the mode of sharing. We are not merely sharing our opinions, our perspectives, our personal beliefs, our viewpoints. We make it clear at some point that we're not speaking for ourselves or from ourselves. We are speaking on behalf of another, relaying the message of another, and appealing to the authority of another. Don't think here chiefly in terms of your own confidence or your knowledge or apologetic preparation or rhetorical polish. Listen to Jesus prepare his disciples in Matthew 10. You will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Another way to think of this is in terms of sharing God's own testimony of himself. I love the way David puts it in Psalm 119. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. For I delight, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. Let those who fear you turn to me that they may know your testimonies. Your commandment makes me wiser than all my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. One way I have presented God's word in Utah is to invite the other person to share their own testimony. So, Would you share your testimony with me? That's a familiar phrase in, in Utah. Then I say, I'd like to share testimony. It's not my own. Consider 1 John 5, verse 9. If we receive the testimony of, ma- of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he has borne concerning his Son. <clears throat> Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. So, brothers, if we're going to share the gospel, let's rise to the assertive level of, thus saith the Lord. And, quote, the Bible says, I wonder if you're fearful of being uh, associated with fundamentalists or people who don't seem as respectable or sophisticated. Let's just join our unsophisticated brothers in saying, well, the Bible says what God says. Let's not endlessly couch ourselves with the softening language of, well, the way I see it is, or in my view, in my faith tradition, there is a time and a place for that, but as Peter says in 1 Peter 4, whoever speaks, do so as one who speaks the oracles of God. Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with patience, with great patience and instruction. Sometimes a Christian from a visiting evangelism team to Utah would ask me, Why do you go to the Bible in your evangelism if the person you're speaking to doesn't even believe in the Bible? Shouldn't you first seek to convince them through apologetics that the Bible is true before using it? This misunderstands the power and authority of God's word. Here's how the London Baptist Confession of Faith puts it. 
The authority of the Holy Scriptures obligates belief in them. This authority does not depend on the testimony of any person or church, but on God, who is the author, who the author alone, who is truth itself. Therefore, the scriptures are to be received because they are the words of God. The testimony of the church may stir and persuade us to adopt a high and reverent view for the Holy Scriptures. Moreover, the heavenliness of its contents, the power of the system of truth, the majesty of the style, the harmony of all of its parts, the central focus on giving God all glory to God, the full revelation of the only way to salvation, and many other incomparable qualities and complete perfections all provide abundant evidence that the scriptures are the word of God. Even so, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority of the scriptures comes from the internal work of the Holy Spirit Bearing witness, and here's probably the most important phrase you can remember, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. So it's not as though I close my Bible and I separately pray, and then the Holy Spirit gives me this emotional, confirmatory uh, you, you, you know, uh, epiphany. And then that itself separately witnesses to the authority of God's word. It's that the, the Holy Spirit bears witness by and with the word. So that informs our evangelism. So while secondary, secondary confirmatory evidence has a place, it is to the word we go. Yes, learn the apologetics and prepare your reasons. But these are, in some sense, like rolling out the red carpet for the main attraction. Hebrews 4 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. This is your weapon. You are not chiefly a philosopher or a kind of Christian social worker or a lawyer or an ambassador, I'm sorry, or a lawyer, but you are an ambassador. Christ has empowered you and authorized you to relay his word. Here is where you can let your evangelism decidedly depend on the miraculous. There is a kind of supernatural strangeness and epistemic incomprehensibility, sorry for the phrase, to what you're doing. It's like telling a valley of dry bones to rise up, telling dead people to become alive. You are spreading a word to a resistant people who don't want to believe, who don't accept even your assumptions about what even makes something believable, all the while appealing to an authority outside of yourself. And not only that, you're telling them that God became a man and he died, and that he died what seemed to the world a shameful, embarrassing, and criminal death. And, oh, by the way, that's your savior. And he rose again. This is utter foolishness to the world. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So are you feeling proud? Like you want to show off how clever and sophisticated you are? Then evangelism isn't for you. We are God's fools. Think again of the farmer illustration. He sows seeds, God gives growth. Another practical way, I enter into the mode of, of declaration is to do what I call supremacy evangelism. This is a form of bragging about God or boasting in God. Jeremiah 9 says, Let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. It is unapologetically a way of saying, My God is bigger than your God. Or, My Messiah is big, better than anything you have to offer. In Utah, for example, there is a pride people take in building many temples, that they, you, 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 you drive through the valley and you can see that the, the, the temples here and there and there. With ongoing rituals to help people gain favor with God, so I like to ask, what did Jesus say about the temple? And people typically can't think of anything, so I offer to share some Jesus stories. So I go down a path. Do you remember in John 2 when Jesus entered the temple and he took a whip and he overturned the tables, and he was asked, what authority, what right do you have? What sign will you show that you have the authority to do this? And Jesus said, tear down this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. And they were like, what are you talking about? It's taken us decades to build this temple. And the temple, John says, he was speaking of was what? His body. In John 4, Jesus met the woman at the well, and she uh, 
says to him. Our ancestors worship over here in this mountain, uh, but the Jews worship at the temple in Jerusalem. You know, what do you say? And Jesus says, Woman, believe me, the hour, the hour is coming, and it's already here, when the true worshipers of God won't worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem. God is spirit, and is, he's seeking people to worship him in spirit and in truth. In John 7, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me, out of his heart, will flow rivers of living water. And John said, he said this because he had yet to give the Spirit. And in John 14, Jesus says to his disciples, the Spirit is with you, but he will be in you. In Matthew 12, uh, Jesus is, I think they're eating on the Sabbath, and Jesus tells a story. He says, you know, haven't you considered David and his group? They, they pass through, they stop by the temple, David strolls right in, he takes some of the showbread, and he and Jesus ends up saying, I'm telling you, this is a cool phrase, a haunting phrase, something greater than the temple is here. Ooh, pause on there. Mufasa, ooh. <laughs> something greater than the temple is here. In Holy Week, Jesus, I think on the Mount of Olives, or maybe he's leaving the temple structure, and the disciples say, Jesus, uh, isn't this big and beautiful? Isn't this amazing? And Jesus says, I'm telling you, not one stone will be left standing on another. And when Jesus is on the cross, crying out his final breath, the Bible says that the veil of the temple was torn. That thick veil, that thick curtain separating the holy room from the holy of holies was torn in two. That's astounding. So we learn later in the New Testament that Jesus has opened a new and living way for us to enter the throne room of God with confidence and boldness. And Jesus Christ has accomplished the purposes of the temple. Something greater than the temple is here. I mean, you share that. And you're like, okay, brag about your temples now. Like, Something greater than the temple is here. Another path I go down, especially with polytheists, is that of Isaiah. In Isaiah, there is a kind of throwdown between Yahweh and the nations. He asks them, to whom will you liken me or to what likeness will you compare me? He says, to whom will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. And then, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? He asks, who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him counsel? Who's ever been God's tutor or Sunday school teacher or piano teacher? Who ever taught God anything? I am the Lord, he says, who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. He's bragging. He's totally bragging. I did it by myself. I stretched it out all by myself. No participation, no, no collaboration needed, no help. No consultation. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I would give to no other. He says in Isaiah 43, Before me no God was formed, neither shall there be after me. And I 44, he says, I am the first, I am the last. Besides me there is no God. He goes on, Is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. And then he says, this is like a hammer. For my own sake I do it. For my own sake for how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. So how do, you, how do you share those? Well, first, you have to be familiar with them. You might just highlight them in your Bible. So you could just flip, read, flip, read, flip, read. To this, I sometimes heard an incredulous, what is this? Like a, my God is bigger than your God contest? And I'd say, yes! This is exactly what this is. That is exactly what God was doing with the false gods of Egypt. That is what Elijah was doing with the false gods of Baal. It is exactly what Paul was doing with the inadequate deities in Athens. Turn to Acts 17 with me real quick. This will give us a good example of declaration, even confrontation. Acts 17, 
verse 16, Acts 17, 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshiped God as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Paul the evangelist. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, who is this ignorant, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Verse 19, they took him and brought him <clears throat> to Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching you are presenting? Because what you say sounds strange to us and we want to know what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Paul stood in the middle of Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I found and even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it. He is Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they, might, of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God, now listen to this. This is not a suggestion. This is not a sharing for mere consideration. Listen to the, the forcefulness of this. God now commands all people everywhere to repent. This is Paul talking to philosophers. Because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him. But others said, we'd like to hear more from you about this again. I'll finish out with some more stories in the vein of proclamation. I hope these are encouraging to you. June 21st, 2017. I started preaching tonight by declaring woes against Scott Hensey. This is a, a, uh, an exceptional circumstance. Scott Hensey was the local Mormon stake president. He's a kind of a leader of leaders in uh, this area of Utah. And there's some backstory to this. But he would come out with a kind of smug look on his face and interfere a bit with the evangelism and he was very snide we had we had had dozens of long conversations with him he, he had heard the gospel up and down <clears throat> and he was resisting the gospel opposing the christians and i was street preaching and he walked by and he's a big shot he's like you don't you don't you know you 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 respect that guy that's that's mormon culture um not to not to confront him. So I started preaching woes against him. Woe to you for putting heavy burdens on the people and not lifting a finger. For not teaching that the authority of the words of Jesus is enough. For not teaching your people to worship a God who never sinned. Scott, in the audience, responded with arrogance and mockery right in front of the crowd of Mormons. Then a crowd of LDS youth gathered and listened 
And one of them stepped forward. His name was Ethan. He was passionate. He told me he was going on a Mormon mission in six months, and that I should give him reasons not to go. It's kind of a challenging way. I told him I could give him the words of Jesus. That the Great Commission says we should teach people to observe everything that Jesus commanded. Remember that? Uh, Teaching them to observe everything that I commanded. He says that in the Great Commission. So, in order to do that, we ought to learn what Jesus taught. I shared Matthew 13, from Matthew 13, parables, where Jesus says the kingdom would start and perpetually and continually grow until the end, whereas Joseph Smith taught that the seed had died and needed replanting. We had some interactions. Again, he was very passionate. I spoke the words of Jesus on family. Jesus tells us who our real family is, and he teaches about the cost of discipleship, even denying our own family. Jesus says it would be better to be a eunuch, a single celibate person for the sake of the kingdom. The Mormon responded incredulously, Ethan, that is, he asked if he could be happy in heaven without an eternal wife. That's the context. They think they have the good news of when you get married in their church, you're married for eternity. So he said, you know, incredulously, could someone even be happy without an eternal wife? And I said, yes, yes. And I'm being dramatic here for all the teens and the youth and the young adults. Yes. Jesus said that if you believe in him, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. That if you eat him as the true bread, you will never be hungry. That he has water that will make you never thirst again, even without a wife. He left dramatically, and he told me to step down from the stool. A group of LDS teenagers clapped, and they laughed at me. Rich, a friend, then approached that group and had a fruitful conversation with them. And then evidently changed, they evidently changed their attitude toward that of curiosity and respect. Nothing just like a good old-fashioned adult conversation. A bunch of teens to get them to calm down and show some respect. I continued to preach to those remaining, but the Christians had wonderfully snatched them up into small group conversations. At the end of the night, a brother told me I had my fly down the whole night. (laughs) Humbling, I guess. August 25th, 2017, I preached to a mostly tourist group tonight. They were waiting for the doors to open for the tabernacle choir practice. Some Mormons in the crowd came out to talk to me. The context here is, I got out of the car, I remember this, and it, we usually, like, chill and pray and gather as Christians, and then we, you know, leave and go and evangelize. But, man, I got out of the car, and there was just, like, whew, was like 40 people lined up, um, and they're just standing there in line waiting to get the, the, to, to the choir practice. And so, so I got to preach. So it's largely tourists who want to hear the choir pre- preach, and it, it's a lot of... Uh, Mormons that have brought their friends and family to hear the choir, right? So they're very concerned that I not spoil the occasion for them. So Mormons in the crowd came out to talk to me, and I, I, I must have brought up the issue of race. Uh, maybe there was some uh, African Americans in the group. Uh, some background here, Mormonism said that if you had black skin, you could not hold leadership positions or obtain the priesthood until 1978. I brought that up, and I usually use it as a segue to the gospel because the gospel doesn't predicate receiving eternal life or the benefits of the gospel by skin color. I mean, it's by grace through faith alone apart from works. A Mormon came out from the crowd, some Mormons, and said that God's supposed refusal to give the Mormon priesthood to blacks was morally justified. They said it was similar to what God did in choosing the Jews as a people. So I asked, why did God choose the Jewish people? A young Mormon man said, because they believed God and they were obedient. I replied, absolutely not. God did not choose them because they were faithful or believing or obedient. They certainly were not impressive. God chose them because they were not impressive. He blessed them to fulfill promises to the patriarchs, not to show how impressive they were, but to show how impressive God is. 
Deuteronomy 7, 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples on the face of the Lord. The Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you are the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So God chose a non-supreme people group to display the supremacy of his grace and faithfulness. And God used his people as a theater for the world. They displayed the impossibility and failure of a covenant relationship which says, if you obey, I will bless you. Israel's failure, its disobedience, its exile, its misery, illustrates the failure of all humanity. We won't obey. Romans 3 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth might be stopped, so that the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. So no, this is not the moral equivalent of telling black people they are cursed with black skin due to a supposed moral failure in premortality. This is not the moral equivalent of telling black people that they were, unlike the rest of us, supposedly not quote-unquote worthy. And this is in front of dozens of tourists. This same young man went on to say that the LDS priesthood ban on blacks and its theological explanation were not quote-unquote official doctrine, but, but he tried again to justify it. He asked me, so what about the curse of Cain? What about the mark that God put on him? And this is sort of borrowing from the... Uh, unfortunately, this is inherited from... Protestant racism in America, with, with theological justifications for racism. Um, and there's this kind of a, a historic Mormon carryover where people thought that the curse of Cain was comparable to a, a curse of having a certain skin color. So I replied, this was not a curse. The curse for Cain's murder was to be a wanderer. God put a mark on him not to curse him, but to bless him and to graciously protect him while he wandered. I explained to the crowd that this racism issue was ultimately a gospel issue. God made a promise to Abraham to bless all the nations through him. The gospel is that because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, all who share in the faith of Abraham are freely given forgiveness, justification, adoption, the gift of the Spirit, and the fullness of eternal abundant life. Everyone eventually left to enter the conference center to hear the choir practice but a tourist lady came up and squeezed me on the shoulder and said, I just want you to know that some of us agree with you. Thank you. It was quite a night. Those were the, <laughs> that was the first 20 minutes. <laughs> Later in the night, I spoke to an Indian man named Mal. He was a doctor. He said he had spent much of his time studying to become a doctor and that he now wanted to study more basic questions. So he was now studying religion. He spoke in broken English as a second language. And forgive me here for, <clears throat> um, you'll see. He said, I think there might be a God, so I try not to do, and he inserted a colorful word here I can't repeat. It became clear in the conversation he was not trying to be coarse or funny. That was just his broken English term for sin. <laughs> so I asked, well, what do you do with all the evil in your heart? How do you get forgiven? He said, I try to be positive. I explained to him that thinking positively won't take away the bad stuff. I'll go for another three minutes, I think. A criminal, for example, has to pay his debts. Christianity says that God became a man and suffered capital punishment to pay our debts. I encouraged him to read one of the four Gospels, but I think he was confused by this and didn't know what I was talking about. I asked him if he used YouTube, and he said, oh, yes. So I encouraged him to watch some gospel videos. We had Christians from six different churches. We sang and prayed and enjoyed the night. God provided peace. <clears throat> I'll skip down here. Here's one more for you. I overprepared today. August 10th, 
2018. I later talked to Olga. She is a Russian lady who spoke decent English. She asked me if I was allowed to be on the sidewalk. And I said that it was legal in America to exercise religious free speech on public sidewalks. What is it about Russians? <laughs> she indicated some background with the Russian Orthodox Church. I asked her if she had ever read the New Testament. She hadn't. Or if she had heard the gospel. She hadn't. So I summarized the gospel for her. She replied that she preferred to find truth in all religions. I said, Jesus said he was the way, the way, the truth, and the life. She replied, no, Jesus is a way. So I replied, but Jesus said he was the way. She politely took some gospel tracts and left. Lastly, I talked to an older LDS man. He said that there was not a more pure and clean people than the Mormon people, and that no religion on earth had the priesthood. So I pressed him to think of any examples in the Bible of priesthood ordination happening by laying on of hands, that is, from priest to priest, or any association of power or authority for believers in the New Testament with the Aaronic or Melchizedek priesthood. It's simply not there. Jesus often authorized by his mere words in healing, forgiving, exercising demons, sending, commanding. He later explained that God would be bored if he himself wasn't still learning and that God learns from us. So I shared from Isaiah 40 and Romans 11, which quotes from Isaiah, that God has never learned anything. He replied that God would never say such a thing. He also explained that God, that if God did not send more prophets and more priests, then he would not be a kind God. This would mean that God had abandoned us. So I walked him through a little of Jesus' speech in John 14 through 17. It's called the Upper Room Discourse. Where Jesus explains how he doesn't abandon us or leave us as orphans. Jesus freely gives us the Holy Spirit and reminds, of us, reminds us of his words and leads us into all truth. Jesus' words and the spirit he sends are more than enough to experience his enduring kindness and his love.